Hi, I'm Linda Mao, and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Kimball Art Museum, and our interviewer, Amy Cardoso, speaks with exhibition co-curator, Jennifer Kassler Price, about the exhibition, From the Lands of Asia, the Sam and Myrna Myers Collection. Now for Art This Week. Hi, we're here at the Kimball Art Museum for their new exhibition, From the Lands of Asia. I'm here with Jennifer Kassler Price, who's the curator for Asian and non-Western art. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, pleasure to be here. <laughs> so talk to us about the beginning. Um, Sam and Myrna Myers started this beautiful collection. What was the spark that caused them to start collecting? So it's really an interesting story because they um, really didn't start out as collectors. They, neither one of them had a background in art history. Um, they both came from uh, fairly modest means um, and they found themselves in Paris in the 1960s. You know, if they were buying anything, it was just, you know, maybe decorative items, you know, cheap things that they would find in, in a little shop someplace. Um, but one day they were traveling in Switzerland and uh, quite by chance, and Sam likes to talk about how the role of chance really um, played into the building of their collection and certainly the genesis, uh, they, they got lost. They were heading to one city and they ended up in another city and then they were like, well, what are we going to do now? And they, um, someone said, well, down the road in this town, Escona, um, there are some antique shops. And they said, well, let's go check that out. So they go to the town, and on the square, there's a grand um, kind of house slash gallery. And they walk in, and they see all these beautiful objects in vitrines. And it's you know four floors, and they're kind of puzzled. They don't know if it's a museum, if it's a gallery. And the woman that ushers them in says, please take your time, look at everything. And they do, and they finish up, and then they're introduced to the to the uh, owner of this gallery, and he said, "So, did you, you know, see anything you like?" And they're like, "Oh my goodness, everything is so <laughs> beautiful." And it's it was mostly um, Roman and Greek antiquities, um, which was kind of the vogue at the time in the '60s, and this being Europe as well. Um, and Sam says, "Well, I mean, we just we don't have a lot of money. There's we couldn't afford anything." He said, "Well, what could you afford?" And um, Sam kind of blurts out, well, $20. And so the owner, instead of shoo-shooing them away, um, he says to his uh, assistant, Fritz, bring me the Tanagra heads. And so these little, tiny, tiny little heads that date to the 5th, 6th century BC are brought out and presented. And he says, you can have any of them for $20. And so Sam and Myrna are just astounded that they can actually own a piece of history you know, not, not just a knick-knack, but mm -hmm. a real piece of history, you know, for $20. And that begins their journey. That, that sparks an interest in art in general. Um, from there, they continue to collect on a pretty small um, scale antiquities, which again was what they were exposed to mostly. But eventually, again, the role of chance comes into play when they are in Belgium in the town of Ghent one day uh, in a caught in a rainstorm and they seek cover in a shop that's selling Chinese porcelain, mm -hmm. blue and white porcelain. They don't know anything about porcelain, just like they didn't know anything about the antiquities. But they're introduced to Chinese blue and white porcelain. And what it does is it really sparks um, a passion for, not just for Asia, but a thirst for knowledge, a, mm -hmm. a quest to learn more. So it's not just about acquiring things and amassing things um, or filling in the blanks. It's really about you know responding to each and every object that they um, encountered. And whether they knew something about it or not, but certainly if they didn't know something about it, they would seek out information. They didn't know anything about blue and white, so they begin to study. And Myrna ends up going to the Ecole de Louvre to actually take a course in Asian art so that she can learn more about porcelain. And slowly, you know, from porcelain, it moves to jade. From jade, it moves, moves to silk. Um, you know, along the way, they're also being exposed to Buddhist art, so sculpture, 
um, textiles, paintings. So jade was of huge importance in the Chinese culture. Can you start by talking about the bee and song works that we see from the Neolithic period? Yes. So um, jade, it cannot be underestimated how important jade is to the whole history of Chinese culture. It's important than any other material. Mm -hmm. You know, in the West, we kind of treasure gold and silver, but in China, it's all about jade. Um, jade uh, dates back, the, the use of jade and the manipulation of jade dates back to the Neolithic period to um, around 4000 BC, so quite old. And um, jade is a very, literally it's a hard material. It's a hard material to carve. Mm -hmm. You cannot use metal tools. You actually have to carve it um, using an abrasive technique of sometimes a string or a bamboo tool that you put sand and water and literally kind of saw back and forth. I mean, just the fact that they would figure out how to do that. <laughs> um, and then craft, you know, these objects. The B, which is a circular perforated disc, um, and uh, you'll see in the collection can range in size from, you know, five inches to 20 inches in circumference and again thin and thick and this very um, enigmatic song which is a squared cylinder so it's a three-dimensional square jade but it has been drilled through to the center so that it's hollow and then also carved on the outside we have no idea what these things really were used for or what they meant what we do know is we find them in burial context mm -hmm. so these were important because the Chinese were taking them with them to the, to the grave. Right. You know, they wanted these things in the after, afterlife. Um, they obviously, well, I say obviously, we, we presume that they had some ritual significance. Maybe were used in some kind of ritual ceremony. Um, we hypothesize that the B, which is a circle, may represent the sun and by extension heaven. Um, the Chinese character for sun is a circle with a dot in it. So that may be the sun or the heaven. Um, the earth is a square, um, and that's also represented graphically. So you've got the earth, but then you have, it's pierced by mm -hmm. a circle. Again, pierced maybe by the heavens. Um, maybe it's a portal. Maybe it's a way of communicating with the ancestors. I mean, we really don't know, but it's really kind of cool mm -hmm. to think about it. And then just, again, for me to think about the labor that it took. You know, you mine this mineral, nephrite, um, and then carving it and the time that took. And this is thinking back to, this is a hunting, gathering, farming society where, you know, you're working pretty hard just to you know, exists, yeah. and then somebody is there sawing away <laughs> in the jade. Um, and I guess, you know, what we have to remember that's also important about the jade is that it's very much a symbol, obviously, of rank and status. Um, you know, th this is for the higher echelons of Chinese society, whether it's, you know, military or imperial or wealth, but it is a symbol of your status and rank and uh, you um, use it or you wear it in life and you take it with you to the grave um, into the afterlife. So you mentioned the jade pendants. Um, I read that it was to reflect virtues of the person who wore them, which would have been a member of the highest society. Can you talk about the composition of the pendants and the visual metaphor that it would have to the wearer? Sure. Starting in around uh, the 10th century BC in the Zhou period, um, we begin to see jade uh, being used in a different way. Um, you know, the, the bee and the tsong, which is, we don't know what they're used for. Then later you have jade that's carved um, into axes and blades. Mm -hmm. So obviously based on some utilitarian implement, but fashioned into jade, um, again, used in a ritual context and symbol of social status. In the 10th century, we see that they begin to wear jade, okay? And so they fashion it into various types of pendants. There's a huang, which is kind of a semicircular shape. Uh, there's, again, kind of a disc shape with a larger perforation. We see that they're carved on the surface with different patterns, little 
um, circles and curlicues and dragons and tigers. Um, part of the carving has to do with um, making the surface kind of shimmer when light hits it. Mm -hmm. Also, these jades are very thin and translucent. Um, one thing that I want to mention about jade, what is uh, what the Chinese are attracted to is the color. Now, I think in the West we think jade green, mm -hmm. but you'll white. see. Well. There's green, there's uh -huh. yellow, there's brown, there's white. There's mm -hmm. this whole range of colors which actually comes from the mineral composition of the jade and the different minerals that are in the jade. And um, that gives it different colors also. Sometimes in burial, uh, those minerals are leached to the surface and we get different colors. But for the Chinese, they love these colors, um, particularly the translucency of a lot of these jades and the purity, and they equated that with the purity of a man of the most high moral character. Mm -hmm. Confucius likened the purity of jade to the purity of the jinzu, which mm -hmm. is the Chinese gentleman. Um, so a man of a certain standing, of a certain proposed moral character, would be wearing jade uh, like a pectoral that was made up of all these different pendants and they're tied together um, and suspended and they're very thin and you have to imagine in your mind that as you're walking they're moving mm -hmm. and they're hitting one another and they're literally making a tinkling sound mm -hmm. and so walking into a room you are noticed i mean people are hearing you even before they're seeing you and the fact that you're wearing this it is presumed that you are a man of a certain character. Um, and I just think that's really interesting that it functions in that way. And then again, all of these jades um, follow the owner into the afterlife because you want to make sure that, that your moral character is being preserved into the afterlife. So they also have many Buddhist works. What kind of iconography do we usually see, um, in, whether it's in sculpture or textiles? Right. So um, the two kind of main Buddhist icons um, are going to be the Buddha, who um, can be the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, or sometimes it's cosmic Buddhas, um, and then bodhisattvas, who are um, also enlightened being, beings, but they're kind of, uh, they sort of function like saints in Christianity. Um, when you're looking at Buddhist icons, whether it's um, three-dimensional or two-dimensional, the easy way to distinguish between a Buddha and a Bodhisattva is that a Buddha is always dressed in monk's robes. Um, so he's very plain, very simple. He's usually seated in meditation. Um, he has certain, um, certain things indicate his supernal um, nature. So he has a bump, a cranial bump, a little dot on his forehead. His earlobes are elongated. Um, but he's always dressed in monk's robes because that um, indicates uh, the time when he went to meditate under the Bodhi tree to mm -hmm. attain enlightenment. Now, bodhisattvas are always dressed in princely secular garb. And the reason for that is that they, um, they are referring to the fact that the Buddha was a prince uh, before he became the Buddha. Um, and before he reached enlightenment. Bodhisattvas have reached enlightenment, but they've put off the final attainment of nirvana so that they can stay in the human realm, the secular realm, to help those of us who are still on our path. So again, that's kind of how they function like saints a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting about the bodhisattvas is that they're always um, dressed in the secular um, princely garb of the period and the culture in which they were made. So whether it's in China or Japan or Tibet, um, and, and they're kind of more interesting that way because they're, they're, they've got jewelry and scarves and wonderful flowing drapery and they're colorful and sometimes they're moving. And um, so that's kind of the main way to distinguish those two main deities. But um, what's interesting in Tibetan Buddhist art is the use of textiles. Mm -hmm. And you will have traditional tankas, which is basically a tanka is a portable scroll. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a depiction of a Buddha um, sort of seated on a, on a lotus throne in a Buddhist paradise. And it's a focus of visualization for the practitioner to sit in front of and meditate and chant and 
really enter into the realm of that deity, um, into the spiritual realm. And, and it's a way of reaching enlightenment in, it's the shortcut version, sort of. Instead of many, many lifetimes, you can do it maybe in this lifetime. Um, there are two really interesting examples in the Myers collection of a different kind of mandala, um, which is made up of patchwork uh, textiles. Mm -hmm. Tibet did not have a native silk tradition. Right. They got a lot of their silks from China through um, both commerce and diplomatic trade. And they would take these fabrics and cut them, you know, cut them into little triangles. And if any of you have done patchwork quilting, you'll know what I'm talking about. You know, you cut the little triangle, you have to fold over the corner, you have to stitch it together, then you stitch two little triangles together to make a square, and then you stitch the squares together to make a bigger square, <laughs> bigger and bigger, and then there's a border. And if you can imagine the patience mm. and the time and the repetitive movement and motion, it's like chanting and it's a meditation. And so in making the mandala, it's you are going into a spiritual realm. You know, you're, you're becoming kind of one with, with, um, with the deity. And then once it's finished, it's this geometric pattern, which also kind of functions like a portal. Uh, in, into the abode of the deity. And so even though it's abstract and you don't see a physical manifestation, it's understood um, that the deity is there. And just again, like the repurposing of fabric, the cutting up and then re-sewing, it's, it's that idea of reincarnation, right. of being reborn, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty cool. So all those things together, I mean, when you look at it on the wall, you think, oh, that's just a nice patchwork quilt, but it's so much more. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I hope everybody comes and sees the show. There's something for everyone here. We want to thank Jennifer for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to KimballArt.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polar